Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not a map maker um, or a scientist or a conservationist. I'm an architect and an environmental historian, but I like to think I am starting to use maps in my work. So you'll see a little bit of that at the end. Um, this project is in progress and eventually will be a chapter in my dissertation. So to give you all an idea about what I'm doing, I'm going to give you the larger frame. Um, so farm fields are built environments though they may not look that way to the untrained eye. If you're unfamiliar with what Iowa looks like from above, this is it. Um, once part of the native tall grass prairie ecosystem, the farm fields of the North American Midwest represent the quintessentially American heartland. Altered by human forces and simple on the surface, these fields are in fact complex design systems of infrastructure valued as some of the highest quality agricultural land in the world. To construct them, farmers plowed under the native flora, excavated the soil, and installed miles of subterranean drainage tile that channels water to a series of ditches, rivers, and communities downstream. Over time, as the practice of farming evolved from subsistence to industrialized, capital-intensive big ag, the farm fields consolidated, becoming ever more sophisticated systems of infrastructure. Culturally, these artificial environments have been naturalized, Agricultural fields are perceived through a lens of regional romanticism as peaceful, wholesome, and natural. These fields, though cultivated by machines, are one of the few places Midwesterners can see anything that seems like nature, even if that apparent nature is very much a product of human artifice. The limits of humans' abilities to sustainably shape the environment are now being felt, and the experience of those limits in the rural environments must be understood. Too often, the focus of the climate crisis is urban, industrial, and car-centric, and in reality, the radically transformed landscapes of the rural built environment also have huge implications for the climate and the future of this planet. Farm fields are leading us toward ecological collapse. The path to that collapse is long. Um, it began many millennia ago when humans first invented agriculture. And the tipping point to profound unsustainability came much more recently during the agricultural and industrial revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. Euro-Americans replaced the native ecologies for crop and livestock production, and science provides biological, ecological, and climatological consequences of these events, but lacks historical grounding because understanding consequences alone erases a long, complicated process of material change. Um, produced through the modern landscape. So this is the area that I focus on, uh, primarily the little box in red down at the bottom, but the ecosystem ranges all the way up to the Canadian Rockies. It's called the Prairie Pothole Region, um, with special emphasis on north central Iowa. And my project will hopefully explain the interconnectedness of the geological, biological, ecological, indigenous, and Euro-American colonial pasts through a series of deep maps. Deep maps aren't necessarily traditional cartography. Um, they're not also, uh, they aren't necessarily visual. Uh, they can be textual, multimedia things. Um, and they typically use, uh, they narrate small places, consider the people, animals, and objects through transdisciplinary sources and deep time. So, and deep time for me is geological time. I start, I start thinking about the history of this place about 75,000 years ago with the last glacial episode, the start of the last glacial episode across this space. So, um, it's an understudied geographical area as far as history goes, uh, and it's the most ecologically altered place in North America. Okay, so how do I do this? Um, it seems big, and it is. It's probably too big. I'm writing a dissertation. It's probably too big. Uh, I'm sure that's happened to other people. Uh, the story for me begins here. Um, in the land of 1,000 lakes with one small body of water, Lake Cairo in Hamilton County, Iowa. Lake Cairo was one of many prairie potholes dotting the landscape, a succession of small to large sized bodies of water folded into flat plains and gently rolling hills. 
A sea of grasses connected these islands of water into a subtle but intricate ecosystem that included a variety of soil, flora, and fauna. The result of several millennia of natural forces working upon the earth, uh, the prairie pothole region uh, covered 3.25% of the land mass of the North American continent across six states, three Canadian provinces, and the territories of at least 29 indigenous groups. With comparatively minor human-made changes, this landscape remained consistent until the late 19th century. Only recently did humans exercise influence on the region's environment. And in 1895, somebody named D.A. Kent, David Allen Kent, a former professor at the Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, now known as Iowa State University, began to drain Lake Cairo. Seeking to better exploit the high quality soil of the lake bed, Kent's experiment lasted approximately two years when it failed financially um, and catastrophically flooded during a big flooding event, uh, leaving Hamilton County to finish the drainage process. And that's the original plat map for the drainage engineering. By 1911, Lake Cairo no longer existed as a lake. Its disappearance makes it a typical example of a large-scale pattern in the region where wetlands gave way to farm fields drained by elaborate, if only subtly visible, human-built water control systems. Uh, the narrative of the draining of Lake Cairo can seem heroic. Uh, the lake's transformation into productive farmland could be considered as one of many battles in a long war against nature by Euro-Americans seeking to master the land. But put within a larger narrative frame, the draining of the prey pothole ecosystem was a rupture. The use of history in deep time cast this triumphal story of American agriculture and progress in a very different light, um, not as constructive, but as destructive. Assuming the now non-existent places like Lake Cairo are important, facilitates a long recovery of the historical processes that created the world as it exists today. So that's the dissertation. We'll see. Today, um, I'm talking about whooping cranes. And so why? Why am I talking about whooping cranes? Um, so whooping cranes, Gras Americana, Wapo Uchi Chuck, or Grula Blanca. Um, I also have a French and Creole name for whooping cranes that I got from another conference. I should add those. Somebody shared them with me. A five foot tall white bird with black markings on the wings, whooping cranes are native only to North America. They're a migratory species that summers, nests, and winters on different parts of the continent. Today they winter in Aranas National Wildlife Refuge on the Gulf Coast of Texas. They nest in summer in Wood Buffalo National Park in northern Alberta and southern Northwest Territories, Canada, but this was not always the case. I first saw mention of whooping cranes as a native species in a book called uh, A Country So Full of Game about wildlife in Iowa. And curious about them in general, I had a conversation with a retired Iowa DNR biologist and asked him how important cranes were within the historical ecosystems of the state. His response, they were the umbrella species for the wetland. Now, if you're a conservationist, you probably know what that means. I didn't, so I had to go do some reading. Um, but the umbrella species means that if a sustainable population of whooping cranes can survive in the ecosystem, then all other populations of native species can survive because the whooping cranes require the most out of the ecosystem. So the first mention of the whooping crane in the historical record comes from Mark Catsby in May of 1722. In Charleston, South Carolina, Catsby was given a skin of a large white crane from an indigenous person who told him that early in the spring, great multitudes of them frequent the lower parts of the river near the sea and return to the mountains in the summer. Catsby made a drawing of the bird, including it in a full description in his publication, Natural History. I stumbled across a report published in 1952 by the National Audubon Society. In it, author Robert Allen notes that perhaps the original prairies of northern Iowa may be considered as the heart of the former nesting range of the whooping crane. Nowhere else is there evidence of such concentrated nesting, and 66% of the north central US sites were in this region of less than 10,000 square miles. 
Iowa was so important for this species due, the, due to the whooping crane's needs for wetlands, marshes, and mud flats, unlike their species cousin, the sandhill crane, uh, North America's other crane, native crane species, whooping cranes are water birds. Sandhill cranes historically fed in the dry prairies during the day. Um, now they feed in the wintered crop fields and roosted on rivers at night. The whooping cranes historically fed and nested in wetlands in all locations on their migration route. Prehistorically, whooping crane ar archaeological artifacts have only been found in the prey pothole region glaciated areas. The potholes and small lakes of the wetland prairie of north central Iowa were ideal for whooping cranes, and the PPR was the optimum ecosystem for the species, with Iowa seeing the most nesting prior to the 20th century. In May of 1883, J.W. Preston drove across the Iowa wetland prairies. His description of the marsh is at the headwater of the Iowa River presents a firsthand picture of this general habitat. He wrote, quote, years ago when northwestern Iowa was a vast prairie, and this was in 1893, so years ago when northwestern Iowa was a vast prairie, out onto which few settlers had ventured and the monotony was seldom broken save by some wood fringed lake or a herder's shanty, my way lay along the Iowa River from the headwaters which stream westward was a great flat prairie interspersed with marshes and small lakes, about which swarmed countless numbers of shorebirds. In 1886, so prior, seven years prior, he wrote in detail of that part of the marsh where the whooping cranes had built their nests. He said, pond and shallow water overgrown with rushes stretched for miles with occasional tracks of tussocks. Among these I wandered, getting sight of a pair of geese here, a frightened rail there. Occasionally a flock of sand peeps whistled by me. Hours passed away, and when I was turning campward, I caught sight of the snowy forms of a pair of white cranes flying slowly toward me. Both Allen and Dinsmore report that the last nest from Iowa, and one of the last seen anywhere for some 60 years, was found by Rudolph Anderson three miles north of Hayfield in Hancock County, Iowa in 1894. Allen's report on the whooping crane is canonical, it was the first full-length publication on the species, covering everything ornithologists knew or learned about the birds to that point. He did this because at the time of publication in 1952, there were 33 cranes left in the world, whooping cranes. Conservation efforts were underway, and the comprehensiveness of the report was required for effective conservation. So, within my own research, um, I have a few questions uh, about the whooping crane in Iowa prior to their extirpation, or, sorry, extirpation, as well as the specific land use changes that contributed to it. And I'm asking what do spatial patterns of land use change show when considering the changing agricultural systems in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, overlaid with the historical occurrences of whooping crane data. I've started to work within GIS, um, I'll be, uh, this is in progress, and like I said, I'm not a map maker, so if anyone has uh, advice, let me know. That would be great. Um, and um, Alan, from his report, uh, compiled a distribution list of 925 occurrences of whooping cranes, ranging from 1722 to 1948. In 2019, a group of researchers from the USGS and the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin, revised his list to include another 76 occurrences. Um, and I reached out to them for their data and they graciously shared it with me. So um, a few of the things that I'm thinking about within the map making uh, include land use change over time, which um, includes the deep time. So thinking about glaciated areas, that's what this is showing here. This one is showing um, hydrology and historical wetlands, uh, occurrences of historical wetlands across the lobe. This is the Des Moines lobe. This one is the uh, GLO vegetated areas map from the 1853 survey in Iowa. So presumably showing where more marshy wetland areas existed in the lobe. And alternatively, um, 
here's another one, historical wetlands, with the orange being historical wetlands. And then these are drainage, um, probably the large drainage canals, uh, not, not the small tiling, but you can see that drainage happening in the lobe is drastic compared to the rest of the state. That's where the wetlands existed. And then this is the data mapped from the USGS and International Crane Foundation people uh, talking about historical occurrences of the species from 1722 to 1948. So thank you.